So, you have a movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. So I was just going through the list of Disney classics we haven't redone as live action, right? Oh, we still have some left? That's amazing. That's right, sir. Turns out there's one called Pinochio. What? Pina... Pina... Pinocchio. Oh, do you mean Pinocchio? Oh yeah, that might be it. And so what really spoke to me about this one is that we haven't done it yet. Oh, you know what? I like that too. Let's remake an 80-year-old animated movie and slap a big name actor in it because maybe money. I was thinking Tom Hanks as Geppetto. Oh, do you think he could do a consistent Italian accent or... No clue. Let's roll the dice. Oh, how fun. So this guy Geppetto lives in a house with a CGI cat and a CGI fish and he makes CGI clocks. Why does he make clocks? Because his dead wife's main character trait was likes clocks. That makes sense. And he's made clocks of a bunch of Disney characters just a ton of references in there. We talking like Easter eggs or overindulging in self-promotion? Yes. Perfect. So then Geppetto makes a CGI puppet of a little boy because he had a son that died. Oh hell yeah, get those dead relatives in here. Start this off like every other Disney movie. So then he wishes upon a star and this puppet, uh, you know, Pineapple Chai comes to life. Amazing. And then this blue fairy shows up and she's like, hey little wooden boy, if you're good and nice and stuff, you can become a real boy. Wow, so what's the deal with this fairy anyway? Don't worry about it, sir. We're literally never gonna see her again. Oh, okay, great. But before she leaves forever, she looks at a nearby bug and she's like, hey, I'm gonna need you to be this kid's conscience, okay? I'm gonna need you, little insect, to form this child's brain. That makes sense, sure. So then Geppetto's super excited to have a kid again. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Well, but after a couple of days, he's like, all right, you gotta go to school now, because that's what kids do. Get out of here, you child. Does he not accompany him to school? No, he just sends him on his way. This is the man who's lost a child. Yeah, sends a clueless newborn talking puppet unsupervised out into the world, yeah. Wow, well, okay. So obviously this puppet spends like a good 90 seconds staring at a big pile of crap on the road and sniffing it and stuff. I like and approve of that idea so much, I'm gonna pay real money to somebody who's probably passionate about cinema and art to animate that for us. Thank you. And so anyway, then there's this this big talking fox named Honest John and his sidekick, this cat named Gideon, right? Okay, wait, which animals in this world can talk and which ones can't? Some do, some don't, some wear fancy clothes, it's pretty much arbitrary. But what determines which animals- Hey, shut up, so then this talking fox is like, wow, this talking puppet could be famous. Cause talking animals are normal, but not talking puppets. Sure, okay, so Honest John is like, hey, you can be an influencer and a possible name for you is Chris Pine. Oh, topical jokes in movies always age well. They sure do, sir, so eventually this puppet falls follows Honest John and ends up joining this show run by a sketchy guy named Stromboli. Okay. But Stromboli's not very nice and he locks him in a cage. Oh no. Yeah, it's pretty rough, but then Pickled Chia Pet realizes that when he lies, his nose grows. Right, because that's the famous thing this character does. Yeah, sure, all right. So then by lying on purpose, he's able to reach the key he needs to escape. Oh, that's a pretty good lesson for the kids for sure. It is, yeah, resourcefulness and whatnot. Yeah, and also, you know, sometimes lying can help get you out of tough situations. Oh, that's that's, that's not really what I was going for. I mean, not many ways to interpret that one, buddy. He literally lies to get out of a situation. Oh, yeah, no, you're right. Maybe that was what I was going for subconsciously, you know? Lying is pretty effective. Sure is. So then what happens? Well, then Pink Coolio randomly gets picked up by this coachman guy and forced to go to this place called Pleasure Island. Oh, uh, going to Pleasure Island is tight. Oh, somehow it makes me uncomfortable when you say that, sir. As it should. So anyway, the coachman dude brings them to this wacky place where they're allowed to break a bunch of stuff and just misbehave in general. Oh yeah, didn't they drink beer and smoke cigars in the original? Oh, we can't show kids smoking and drinking in 2022. That's not really acceptable. You're definitely right on that one. So what kind of stuff are they going to do? They're going to drink root beer. Oh, kids can't drink root beer. That's terrible behavior. Yeah, and also they're going to smash a bunch of clocks. You know how kids like to smash clocks? That's actually not a thing at all, I don't think. Well, clocks are kind of meaningful to the story, so we're going to pretend like it is. Well, okay then. But Pino Grigio, he doesn't participate in any of this because he's a good boy. So don't we have him participate and be tempted and stuff so he can learn to be a good boy? No, he's already a good boy throughout the whole movie. He knows wrong from right. So what's the point of Jiminy Cricket if Pinocchio already knows right from wrong? I don't know. Do you think we might be missing the entire point of the original? I don't care. Fair enough. So anyway, because he's a good boy, he doesn't get turned into a freaking donkey. But those other kids, they're bad kids because they drank some root beer and destroyed things they were told they could destroy. Exactly. So they get turned into donkeys and sold as slaves to the 
salt mines. So wait, why didn't the coachman just turn them all into donkeys right away? Why have them destroy a bunch of his property on Pleasure Island? Unclear. Oh, okay. So then Peanut Child finds out that Geppetto has sailed to sea to try and go rescue him. So now he's gotta go rescue him. Yeah, go save that old dude. Go save him. But then they're gonna get swallowed up by this big sea monster named Monstro. Oh no. Yeah, it's gonna be pretty rough for a, for a few seconds for sure. Oh, they don't spend a lot of time in there? No, they get out pretty much immediately because Panak Knock, who's there, starts a little fire and the smoke makes the monster sneeze. Well, fantastic. But then the sea monster's gonna chase them. Oh man, it's gonna be tough to get away from a sea monster. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, because this puppet has superpowers now, so he uses his superpowered legs to get them out of there. Oh, he has superpowers. That's great. That's very handy. So then he turns into a real human boy, or he doesn't. I don't know. The cricket's gonna be like, who knows? You know, who knows? The movie ends with a bug being like, who knows what happened? I don't know what happened. That's what we're going with. And so what do you think? Oh, I mean, Pinocchio is one of the most beloved Disney movies of all time. It's hard to go wrong with this one. Agreed. So, you have an original movie for me? Oh, uh, no, no, actually, I- I'm just kidding. So you have a live action or incredibly lifelike CGI remake of an animated classic from the 90s that did really well for us so we could cash in on nostalgia for me? Oh, you got me, sir. I was thinking we could do Mulan. Amazing. Now, we've been getting a lot of criticism that our remakes are just straight up remakes, so we're gonna mix things up at least a little bit here. You know it, sir. I was thinking we could take the animated movie and remove all the, you know, fun stuff. Oh, that is different. Yeah, just take all the joy out of it. See how that feels. Very cool, so no more Mushu the talking dragon, I guess. Yeah, no, we're gonna want this to be a whole lot more realistic, so no more talking animals, no more breaking out into song. Nice. Just grounded realistic stuff, like people that defy gravity and a witch that turns into a bird. What? Yeah, and she has bird talons when she's in human form, and she can turn into people and a thousand bats, and there's a CGI phoenix that shows up from time to time. Kind of a lot of wacky fantastical elements there. Yeah, but all the characters are gonna be somber, so it's mature. I guess that makes sense, so tell me about Mulan. Oh, well, at the beginning of the movie, we're gonna see her as a child, and she's basically superhuman. Oh, she is? Yeah, she has the ability to channel her chi, so she's borderline magic. She's had these powers since she was born? She sure has, sir. So she's straight up, she's Anakin, you know? She's Rey, she's Neo, she's freaking Maybelline. Oh, being born with it is tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in this version, she's not gonna grow into a warrior through cunning and hard work and perseverance? No, sir, she's just the chosen one. And what message do you think that's gonna be sending to kids? I don't know, sir, but what I do know is that this is a superhero movie. Now. Oh, those make us money, so please keep going. So anyway, when she grows up, she has to hide all her special Jedi powers because of tradition. Oh, bummer. But then these bad guys, they're taking over China, so you know, that's not good. And who are these bad guys? Well, there's this bad guy, Bori Khan, who wants to kill the Emperor because he killed his father. And then there's that witch lady who just wants to fit in. Oh, she does. Yes, yeah, she's incredibly powerful and can probably take on China by herself. But Bori Khan is like, when I'm in charge, you'll fit in. So she's like, okay. Cool. So he's nice to her? Not particularly, no. He's actually pretty mean with her. Compares her to a dog. Oh, very disrespectful. And let me tell you, these bad guys, they have a flair for the dramatic. Like, they line up in straight lines before battle for the most dramatic entrances possible. Very sassy. Yeah, and they spend a ton of time on their makeup. They're basically violent theater students. Wow, 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 wow. Anyway, so the Emperor wants a man from every household to go fight the bad guys, but Mulan's dad, he's old and injured, so he's probably gonna die. That's not good. And so Mulan is gonna secretly go in his place and pretend to be his son. Are we gonna have like a super intense and emotional montage like in the animated version where she puts on her father's armor? Not really, no. She's just gonna kind of go. Oh, okay. So then she's gonna go into training and meet some other soldiers. Are they gonna have fun personalities like in the animation? No, because that would be fun. Right, my bad. And so this commander guy, he's really pushing everybody in training because if they don't live up to his expectations, they get sent home. So wouldn't Mulan's father just have been sent home if he had gone? Oh my god. Anyway, so what else happens? Okay, well, so Mulan is trying to hide the fact that she's a Jedi and a woman, right? Right. And the commander, he makes them do this test where they have to walk up a mountain with buckets of water. Oh, and does she figure out, like, a smart way to do that, like the pole thing in the animated movie? No, at a certain point, she just does it because she doesn't want to hide her superpowers anymore. So just straight up brute strength because of the powers she was born with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess that's character growth. It might be. So anyway, later, they end up in battle. Very exciting. And somehow, Mulan ends up lost. What? Yeah, like, she chases 
chases some people and then she's lost somehow. Anyway, then she encounters the witch. Oh, and how does that go? Well, the witch is like, you need to stop lying about being a woman. And then Mulan is very inspired, so she heads back into battle with flowy hair and no armor. Yeah, she should probably wear some armor, though. Yeah, well, she's not gonna, because she learned the art of the dramatic entrance now. Fair enough. And then she's gonna see that the bad guys are, like, launching explosives at the good guys. Oh, no, those blow up. Yeah, so before they can fire another shot, she gets on a horse. She picks up a bunch of helmets. She travels across the battlefield behind enemy lines up the mountain, then sets up the helmets so they think there's more than one soldier there. But how long does it take them to reload? Oh, yeah, that's kind of a lot of stuff, huh? Maybe she teleports because of her chi. Oh, yeah, okay, sure. Anyway, so then she tricks them into causing an avalanche and then gets kicked out of the army for being a woman. Oh, dang it. And then the witch tells Mulan that there's another attack that's gonna happen. So Mulan goes back and tells the army and they're like, okay, you lead the men now. Well, kind of a complete 180 on that one. Pretty much, yeah. And then later the witch is gonna tell Mulan that the emperor has been taken and he's gonna be killed. Okay, so is the witch just verbally leading Mulan to every single plot point in this thing? She is, yeah. Oh, a very guidey witch. Yeah, and then Bori Khan shoots an arrow at Mulan and the witch sacrifices herself in bird form. Oh, sounds like maybe she should have turned herself into a thousand bats on that one. Maybe. And so anyway, then Mulan has a pretty emotional moment with the witch as she's dying. Why doesn't the bad guy like you know, shoot another arrow. Because there's an emotional scene happening. Oh, that's super considerate. And then Mulan's gonna have to go head to head with Bori Khan to save the Emperor. Oh man, it's gonna be tough to beat a badass like him. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, because she's pretty much been a superhero this whole time. She uses her superpowers to make him fall off a thing. And then she jumps in the air and kicks an arrow into his heart. Oh my god. And then everybody's super happy for her because she's embodied all the Jedi by kicking a sharpened projectile into a man's chest. Very nice. And so, yeah, that's about it. What do you think? Well, it sounds like a lot of fun. No, it doesn't sound fun. Not gonna be super fun, no. But, you know, it sounds like it could have cool visuals. Oh, definitely. This thing was made for the big screen. So, you have a movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. I was thinking we could do a Cruella de Vil origin story. The lady from 101 Dalmatians that wants to skin puppies? Yeah, how did she get to be the kind of person that wants to skin puppies, you know? Let's get to know her. Ah, I'd rather not. I don't want to do that. Well, we're gonna. How are we gonna make people want to watch this character's backstory knowing she turns into someone that wants puppy skin? We're gonna have her go up against the Baroness, who's so obviously evil that people are gonna root for Cruella by default. Oh, so by contrasting her with someone more evil that makes her sympathetic? That's right. So technically, we could then make an origin movie for the Baroness. Sure, if we contrast her with somebody more evil, then we can make an origin movie for that villain. Oh, that's a very good point, sir. We could keep making origin movies like that all the way back until the dawn of time. Yeah, I mean, let's not exaggerate. We could probably stop at the dawn of time. Then again, they do say that time is a cruel mistress. Oh, that's a very good point. So we should probably do an origin story for time itself, yeah. Yeah, so maybe time had a rough childhood. Who's to say? Let's cash in. I love it. Anyway, so we're gonna meet Cruella as a little kid named Estella, right? And she was born with black and white hair split right down the middle. Why? Because the character's known for having black and white hair split right down the middle. That makes sense. And one day she's being kind of cruel, right? So her mom is like, hey, your name is Estella, not Cruella. Right. And that's how she got the name Cruella. Oh. Okay. So. All right. See, sir, the thing about origin movies is that sometimes you gotta explain how certain things about a known character came to be. Oh, you do? Yeah, like later in the movie, she's gonna hear about a car called the DeVille, and she's gonna be like, oh, I like that. And that's how she got that part of her name. Well, now that you mention it, I had never wondered about that. Well, now you know. I suppose I do. So anyway, Estella's mom one day is gonna be asking this mysterious lady for money at this gala, right? But these Dalmatians are gonna push her off a cliff. Cruella DeVille's mom was murdered by Dalmatians? She's there was, sir. A Dalmatian jumped on her and she fell to her death. What, did the dog go over the cliff with her? No, the Dalmatian did a kind of drop kick move that it somehow knew, so the Dalmatian is fine. Oh, drop kicking Dalmatians are tight. So then Estella's gonna go to London and meet these little street urchins named Jasper and Horace, and she starts dyeing her hair red. Okay. And so then ten years later, they're like a thief team, right? But her real passion is designing clothes. Sure, sure. So Jasper and Horace get her a job at this department store, and that eventually leads to her getting discovered 
discovered by the Baroness. She's evil. She sure is, sir. So Estella starts working her way up the ranks in the Baroness's fashion company because she has really good fashion ideas. Nice. But then one day she realizes that the Baroness has her mother's necklace, so it clicks like, oh, my mom was kicked by a Dalmatian at this party and I want this necklace back. So what does she do? Well, her and her friends plan a heist at this party, but as a distraction, Estella becomes Cruella. She changes her hair color back to black and white. So she's she's Cruella now. She's Cruella from here on out, sir. She's mean to her friends. She's mean to everybody now. Doesn't revert back to Estella, even at home. Oh, no, she's Cruella now. Oh, that felt a little abrupt, but I'm into it. So Cruella shows up to this party and sets her own dress on fire. Oh my god, is she okay? Yeah, it completely burns up in like a second and reveals an amazing outfit underneath. How does she have Hunger Games fire technology? Unclear, but at this party, the Baroness uses a dog whistle, which like triggers this memory that Cruella has, and she realizes that the Baroness killed her mom. Oh, very rude. Yeah, so now her mission is to start upstaging the Baroness all the time as revenge. Oh, it is? Yeah, she's gonna show up and be like, hey, everybody look at my clothes. Nice. And then later she's gonna be like, everybody look at my clothes. Amazing. And then a bit later she's gonna pop out and be like, everybody look at my clothes. I love it. Oh, and I should mention these are very nice clothes. Oh, that makes it even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So does she hide her face from the Baroness or, or what's up? No, she doesn't. So how does the Baroness not recognize her employee? Well, sir, like I said, her hair is different now. That works. But eventually the Baroness is gonna figure it out. So she tries to, you know, burn her alive. Oh my God. Yeah, but the valet is gonna save Cruella and then he's gonna reveal that the Baroness is actually her biological mother. That's a thing that happens in movies, so it may as well happen in this one too. Oh, it's gonna. So then Cruella goes to this other big party that the Baroness is throwing and she purposefully has the Baroness push her off a cliff. Oh, it's gonna be hard for her to survive being pushed off a cliff. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, see, she designed her skirt to have a parachute inside of it. What? Did she test that? I don't see how she would have, sir, but she's very good at designing clothes, so. So her whole plan was to hide a parachute inside her skirt and use it for the first time during a deadly fall. That's right, sir, and it works perfectly, because that's what I wrote here. Well, great. And then also her team had instructed everyone at the party to step outside behind her, and so hundreds of people saw the Baroness push Cruella. She didn't hear hundreds of people step outside behind her? She didn't, no, and luckily every single one of those people stayed perfectly quiet for some reason. Not a word was spoken. Oh, well, that worked out great. It sure did, sir. So then Cruella inherits the house and the Dalmatians and the fortune, and the Baroness gets arrested. Wow, 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 wow. And then in a mid credit scene, we're gonna reveal that the Dalmatians actually had puppies. Oh, and so are these the puppies that Cruella wants to skin eventually? Oh, well, no, I don't think Cruella would want to skin puppies, but that... That's the character's whole thing. Yeah, well maybe we're doing like an alternate reality, Cruella. Like at a certain point of the movie, it's gonna seem like maybe she did skin some dogs, but she didn't, really. But she's going to eventually, right? That's like the whole character. I, wouldn't, I can't really see her doing that, no. Okay, well why make Cruella's origin movie if she's not gonna turn into the Cruella that people know? Because name recognition will make people wanna come watch the movie and therefore minimize your studio's risk in investing millions of dollars into this project. That's a good point, I love it. Anyway, so Cruella's gonna have have these puppies Perdita and Pongo deliver to Anita and Roger. They're from 101 Dalmatians. They sure are, sir. Why did she deliver dogs to them? Because. That works. So what do you think? Well, I'm a little disturbed to learn that Perdita and Pongo were related, but this sounds like a lot of fun and relatively low budget. Oh, I should also mention that this is gonna take place in 1970s London, so there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for cool music. Okay. And we're gonna take every single one of those opportunities. Oh my god. Let me ask you something. What's your usual music budget? I, I Double it. I didn't even say a number. Then triple that. I, we're gonna have wall-to-wall -wall needle drops in this thing. It's gonna cost you a fortune. Oh, uh-oh, oh no. So, you got a movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. I was thinking, what if we take one of our classic animated movies and make a live-action remake of it? What? What if we did that? Huh. Yeah, you know what? That might actually work. It just might. It just might. Wow, okay, I think we've pretended to be creative long enough, so what are we thinking details-wise? Like shot for shot? Sometimes, yeah. Amazing, any major changes? None that I can foresee anyone on the internet getting mad about. Fantastic. And then obviously we make all the sea creatures super photorealistic, just make their faces completely devoid of emotion. We gotta do that, yeah, of course. You gotta be photorealistic with these talking fish, there's no other way. And I was thinking, hey, 
What if Flounder's not fun to look at? Oh, I like that! And Scuttle's gonna be a very funny seabird. The first time we see it, it's gonna dive into the water and grab a little fish as a snack. Oh my god, in front of Flounder? Yeah, but Scuttle eats a fish that can't talk, so that's fine. You know, that fish's life does not matter. So wait, some sea creatures can talk and others can't? What determines that? Hey, shut up, and so these three friends are having a little chat underwater. The bird is talking underwater? For a little bit, yeah, then it needs to go up for air. Well, so just like in the original, Ariel is obsessed with human stuff, right? She's like, hey, what's going on up there? I'm into it. Sure. And then obviously, you know, there's the father, a king who doesn't approve of his child's yearning for adventure, and he has a funny little sassy advisor that he assigns the task of keeping his kid out of trouble, and the advisor is reluctant, but, you know, doesn't really have a choice. And this king has an evil sibling who tricks the king's child into a dangerous situation because they themselves want to be ruler of the kingdom. The I feel like you showed the wrong clips there. What are you talking about? Those clips were from the wrong movie, I think. What clips? I Never mind. So anyway, one day she saves Prince Eric's life using her siren voice. She uses a hypnotizing siren's voice that mermaids use to trick men into falling in love with them? That's right, sir. So how can we be sure that Prince Eric has actually fallen in love with her? I guess we can't. All right. So they both kind of become obsessed with each other, and it's almost all consensual, probably. Right. And we're gonna have Sebastian, the photorealistic crab, perform that song under the sea. Oh, uh, life being better down where it's wetter is tight. Yeah, so he's gonna be singing about fish playing instruments and whatnot. That'll be fun to see. No, we're not gonna show them playing instruments, that's not realistic. Oh, and then eventually Ariel's gonna meet Ursula and she's gonna present a deal to her. Oh, here we go. Yeah, she'll transform her into a human for three days, but she needs to receive true love's kiss. Right, 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 right. right. But in this version, Ursula's gonna change things up a little bit and cheat by adding this thing where Ariel can't remember that she needs to get a kiss. What? Yeah, because this way it'll feel more like natural love, you know? In the original, it's kind of like, oh, she's trying to get kissed. If Ursula can just lie about the deal, why even bother with a deal in the first place. Unclear. So then Ariel and Eric are gonna go on a couple of ocean-themed dates and fall in love. <laughs> and Ursula's gonna hear about this and she's gonna be like, well, dang, I gotta step my game up. I didn't cheat hard enough. So what does she do? Well, she uses Ariel's voice that she stole and turns herself into a pretty lady and hypnotizes Prince Eric into wanting to marry her. Very sneaky. Yeah, and then I figure there's a good opportunity for an original song here where Scuttle and Sebastian tell Ariel about this. Oh, I think I have an idea of who we could get to write some original music. Me too. Let's say it at the same time. Three, two, one. Lin Manuel Miranda. Miranda. Exactly. Amazing. I literally don't know anyone else who writes original music anymore. He's the only one. He's the only one. So the photorealistic crab and bird do a rap? Yeah, the photorealistic crab and bird do a rap. And then I guess Ariel has to go break up the wedding. Well, in the original it was a wedding, but I feel like we should up the stakes a little bit here. Oh yeah? Yeah, what if instead of a wedding, she has to break up an engagement party? <laughs> oh, those are higher stakes. I know, right? So then Eric and Ariel are gonna kiss, but they're just a bit too late, so she turns back into a mermaid. Oh no. And then Ursula's gonna claim her and kill King Triton. Well, it's gonna be hard for her to take down the ruler of the mer people. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, she has two eels zap him slightly and he dies. Oh. Yeah, and then Ursula accidentally kills her eel, so she gets upset and turns herself into a kaiju. Very exciting. And then Ariel's gonna save the day by stabbing her with a big old ship. Wasn't it Eric who did it in the original? Yeah, but she's the main character, so she's gonna do it. But Eric doing it is what made King Triton see that not all humans are bad. Yeah, well, in this one, we're gonna be like, he was present while it happened, and so that's that works. Oh, well, great. So then Triton comes back to life and he keeps popping up out of the water at about nipple level and just staring at them. What? Because he loves them. Feels kind of weird. And so they go explore the ocean together and we're done. So what do you think? Well, it sounds like another live action remake, you know? It is. I'm just getting concerned that we're starting to run out of animated classics to do this to. You know, what are we going to do next? Well, we'll figure something out. I mean, who's to say a 2016 movie's not a classic? I like the way you think. Hi everybody, Ryan George here. Thanks so much for watching that pitch meeting. I hope you enjoyed it. My break did just start, however, so I'm done talking. I'm not gonna say any more.